Good evening everyone. It's Wednesday evening and we're going to come together again tonight to continue our study in Hebrews. We're continuing in chapter 11. As we come, let's just pause and let's just take a little bit of time with God in prayer. Ask him to prepare our hearts um, and ask him to help a few other people as well. So let us just pause and pray together. Father, thank you for again the day that has been for your blessing upon us this day, for all that you have provided for us. Father, you are a great God and a wonderful God, and we thank you. Lord, as we come to study your word tonight, we want to ask you just to calm and still our hearts, to help us to focus upon you, that we would hear you speaking as we read your word. Father, your word is so important to us, and communicating the lot to, to others it's such an important thing for us. Lord, during this time of pandemic, it is so difficult. So we do remember those, particularly working with our children and young people, um, to keep connection with them and to encourage them and to show them your words. We think of all the, the family and youth workers um, and deaconesses who are working particularly alongside families at this time, alongside our young people. I just ask that you would help them and encourage them. For those who are chaplains to our university students, again, Father, that you would enable them and equip them as they look at ways of engaging with the students and, and it's just being able to show them who you are and how much you love them. Lord, we are passionate about your word. So please be with us now as we explore it together, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, let's read part of chapter 11 together going to start to read from verse 31 or sorry verse 30 down to verse the end of verse 38 at this time so let's read this it was by faith that the people of israel marched around jericho for seven days and the walls came crashing down it was by faith that rahab the prostitute was not destroyed when the people in her city with the people in her city who refused to obey god for she had given a friendly welcome to the spies how much more do I need to say? It would take too long to recount the stories of the faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel and all the prophets. By faith these people over three kingdoms ruled with justice and received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flames of fire and escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put on whole armies and put whole armies to flight. Women received back their loved ones from the dead. But others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better af life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at. Their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prisons. Some died by stoning, some were sawn in half, and others were killed with the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the grounds. Amen. Let's end there at the minute. The writer of Hebrews has been taking us through different people from the Old Testament, telling us of their faith. And now he started to unite the people. He talked about um, how Moses had led the people. He talked about how they'd gone through the Red Sea. Now he very much points it towards the people of Israel as he talks about Jericho. If you remember the story of Jericho, um, an impressive city with great big walls and the people were frightened. How are we going to ever capture this? God has told us that we take this on. We're never going to break through these walls. And they lacked the faith. They were frightened. Spies had already gone out before that. And some of the spies had stayed in Jericho. Uh, and they came back with reports about the land. Some of those reports said, oh, we'll never do it. Two of the spies says, yeah, we can take this land. If God is with us, we can do this. And Jericho was one of those examples. They marched silently around the city. Um, and then on the once a day for six days. And then on the seventh day, 
they marched round it seven times. And on the seventh time round it, blowing trumpets, shouting, cheering, and the walls came down. And the only family that was saved was the family of a woman of ill repute, as it would have been put. Rahab, who is very clearly labelled as a prostitute. But yet Rahab, who realised that the men who were seeking shelter needed her help. And she didn't try to deceive them. She didn't try to corrupt them. She just helped them. And as a result of that, everybody in her household is saved at the time when Jericho is invaded. She had to trust what those men said to her. They said, let down a, a scarlet robe, a rope from your window and we'll know not to touch your house. And she did that. Whenever they came into Jericho, that rope was there. The house was untouched. God let it stand because her house was in the walls and everything else was destroyed. The people were killed and the land was completely um, flattened. But yet Rahab had the faith, the trust. Now these were people who were foreigners to her. People who she didn't know. People who um, were to probably already spread that this these people who come out of Egypt are taking over the land. Uh, and yet she trusted. God asks us to trust him. Even though it might be foreign to us. Even though the idea of trusting is alien. He wants us to trust. That's what faith is all about. And that's what the writer's trying to get across. He, he gives example after example of how God stands by his words, how God can be trusted. Um, he said, look, if God tells you he's going to do something, he will do it. You can bank on it. Um, and, and that's when verse 12, the 32 kicks in. How much more do I need to say? The writer sort of feels like, I've given you plenty of examples. Do you want me to be here for the next year, giving you every example that I can on the sun of how, if we have faith in God, he helps us? And, and so he, he summarises, he, he gives a few names just in passing. But it's really interesting. Verse 34 um, really gets down to the crux of it. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Their weaknesses was turned to strength. You know, it's a good excuse of ours, isn't it? That we turn around and say, I can't do this. I don't have the gifts or I don't have the abilities or I don't have the strength or the energy to do that. And there's no way I could ever possibly do that. Um... I've seen it, say, say, heard uh, when it came to Holiday Bible Club. Oh no, I, there's, there's no way I could do that. Work with children? Um, that, no, it's out of my comfort zone. And yet, whenever people have done it, how God has used them, how God has enabled them to be able to do it, given them the tools and the strength. And it's the same in everything in life. We can't do it. That's reality. Um, we, we just, we, we don't have the ability to do what God calls us to do. But it's, it's God who gives us the ability. It's God who gives us the, the giftings um, to be able to do it. We just need to trust him. And that's the hard part. Um, Got to make no bones about it. Faith is difficult. Faith is hard. Um, no matter what we do or how often we do it, we, we still struggle, don't we? And anyone who says that faith is easy is telling lies because it's not. Because we do face difficulties and problems. And the author of, of Hebrews is quite open about that and upfront about it and honest. He talks about these examples and he talks about how their weaknesses was turned to strength, how they became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. You know, he, he, he shows that. He even says about women receive their loved ones back again from the dead. But then he's very honest and he says, but others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. Look at the hardship of people who follow God. Look at what they suffer. 
turn to the New Testament even, look at John the Baptist. Uh, John is one who is Jesus' cousin, who is called to prepare the way for Jesus' arrival. And he's very much the, the, the announcer um, of the fact that Christ is here, the Messiah has come, uh, and he's the messenger to, br to bring that news. And yet look what happens to him. He's ridiculed, first of all, by the people. Um, he's looked upon with scepticism by the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They, they, they all don't know who this strange person is. And in the end, he is arrested. And in the end, um, he is beheaded. He suffered much hardship. It talks about how others, were, some were stones. Um, verse 37. Um, Stephen, who was there to help the disciples, uh, people lied about him, said that he had blasphemed and said things that he hadn't said. And as a result, he stoned to death because he was following the teachings of Jesus, because he was a follower of Christ, a Christian. It was difficult for him. When you look at the history of the early church from outside the Bible, from the writings, we, we have different persecutions that happen and Christians are scattered. One of the persecutions was um, the Roman ruler at the time said that everybody had to offer a sacrifice to his God. And in after that, you could, you could worship whoever you wanted. Some Christians refused to do that. Um, and because they publicly refused to do that, they were imprisoned. Some were killed. Other Christians ran away. But again, in the midst of persecution, God used it for his glory. Because those times of persecution, whenever the Christians fled away from Rome and from different other cities, they took the good news of Jesus with them. And they talked about that with those people who were around them, wherever they found themselves. And they became the first missionaries as such, um, along with Paul, if you think about it that way. Paul was intentional whenever he set off on his journeys to spread the news. These Christians, as they were scattered, it was unintentional, but God used it. And God used all those situations. So even these verses here from verse, halfway through verse 35 down, talks about um, how the followers of Christ suffered. God used all that. Uh, it talks about how they were destitute and oppressed. It talks about how they were wearing the, the, the skins of sheep and goats. They didn't have linen. Didn't have fine clothes. They literally, if they killed an animal to, to eat, they skinned it to be able to clothe themselves. It says they were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine having to hide in a hole in the ground? It's for us in the Western world, it's 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 we just can't comprehend it. We just can't understand what it'd be like to face that sort of opposition. And yet people did it because they trust, trusted Christ, because they followed Christ, and they still remained firm. This is what verse thirty nine says about them. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith. Yet none of them received all that God had promised. For God had something better in mind for us, so that they would not reach perfection without us. The writer goes back to, they did not receive what God had promised. Do you remember what Jesus said in John 14? In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told would what I have told you? And I go to prepare a place for you, or go to prepare your home for you, that where I am, there you may be also. And he goes on to say that whenever the time is right, he will come and take us to be with him. God promises us a home in heaven. And yet these people lived through fear and torture and oppression, but didn't see that because God designed us all to see it at the same time, at the time whenever we reach heaven. As the author puts it here, 
for God has something better in mind for us so that they would not reach perfection without us. We'll never reach the best that we can be here on earth. We will always be sinful. No matter how close our walk with God is, it will never be perfect. We will never have bodies which are incorruptible um, here on earth. These bodies only last a certain length of time. And they break down and they, and they go wrong and we die. But that's okay. Because God has designed something better for us. God has designed for us a heavenly home. A place where we will not know corruption of our bodies. We will not know corruption as in sin. We will not know, we will have no sorrow, no mourning, no crying, no pain. That's where we are aiming. That's where we are heading. That's where our goal is. That's what has been promised to us. But we don't reach it here on earth. You know, there are certain religions and faiths that would tell you that you can reach perfection here on earth. But the Bible tells us we can't. We'll not see it until we reach heaven. And that's good. Because then, as the writer puts it here, we'll all have it together. You see, we are a family. We're God's family. We've been accepted into his family or adopted into his family through Christ. We are sons and daughters of God. We are brothers and sisters to one another. Even though we are all different, we are united through God's love for us and through what Christ has done for us. So like a, a, a big family living in a house, that's the idea of heaven. But we'll not be a large dysfunctional family. We'll be, we will be a large, perfect family. There'll not be any falling out. There'll not be any fights. There'll not be anybody left behind. There'll not be anybody pushed out to the sides. Nobody left out in the cold, so to speak. We'll all be in heaven together. Yes, we'll all have different places. Who knows where that place in heaven will be? How the lead will be, but we just can't get our heads around that. You try and read Revelation and understand it. it. It's so difficult, but we're not meant to understand it, because again, we're meant to have faith and to trust. Christian life's all about faith, and whenever somebody comes along and says, "But I want to know this, and I want to know that, and I want this explained to me, and that explained to me," we can't. We're not given brains um, to be able to comprehend everything. We're not giving, given all the information that we would need to be able to understand in the Bible. For two reasons, we just, we just don't need it. Um, but the second one is God just wants us to trust him, to have faith. If we can't trust him in that, then how can we trust him in anything? we can't trust that he knows what's best for us how can we trust that jesus came and died for us and that's what he wants us to do trust have faith believe that he will give us all that he has promised us if we can do that then we've achieved a lot the start of verse our chapter 12 says this therefore since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. Let us strip off everything that slows us down, especially the sins that so easily trip us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. God wants us to keep moving forward. God wants us to, to be able to be changed and transformed so that our eyes are fixed upon him, so that we can run this race. God wants us slowly to become more like him, to be more, become more like the example of Jesus and run that race. That means doing the best we can. If you ran a race in those days, it, it was to win it. You know, you, you ran, you didn't run for the pleasure of it in, in this sort of sense. You, you run to reach the end goal. You run to, to finish, to cross the finishing line. And that's what God wants us to keep doing. Keep running that race. Run it as best as you can. Strip off every weight that slows you down. Especially the sins that 
so easily trip us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Keep going, in other words. Leave off the things which aren't helpful, which aren't beneficial. Get rid of them. Keep your eyes focused on that finish line. Keep your eyes focused on the goal, which is a home in heaven. And keep on going. You know, if, I wonder if you've ever watched a race where a runner trips up. And at that point in time, they have two options. You can either lie on that ground and that's your race over. Or you can pick yourself up and keep going. Then that runner knows that they're not going to finish in first place because they've fallen. They've lost time. They've lost ground against the other runners. But they pick themselves up and they keep on going because they want to cross the finish line. And I wonder as well, as you've seen that, have you ever seen anybody who's fallen and somebody else has stopped to help them? Somebody else has sacrificed their position to help that person who has fallen. Well, that's what God does with us. He brings alongside us people who will stop, who will help us get back up on our feet again, and then who will walk with us or run with us till we cross that line. That's what discipleship is all about. Helping one another and teaching one another. That's what finishing the race is all about. Getting back up again and keeping going. You know, the people who were oppressed, the people who were put in prison at the end of chapter 11, the people who um, lost their lives, were the people who you imagine as falling, as stumbling, but they're not. They're the people who kept on running despite everything that was in their way till they finished the race and they crossed the finish line and they reached the goal of heaven. That's what God has set out for all of us. Tonight, I simply want to say, keep running the race. Keep on going. Despite the opposition that you might face, despite the pressures that you might face, despite the, the hatred and the persecution, keep on going because God is on your side. Let's pray. Father, thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you that you are the God who holds us close. Thank you, Lord, that you bring alongside each of us people who help us whenever we need it. And Lord, you bring us alongside others who we can help. Help us to keep running the race with faith and endurance until the day we cross that finish line and we are with you. Father, thank you. Go with us now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, folks, for joining me this evening. Um, Next week, again, we'll be back to our Bible study and prayer time. And again, the details will be available for the Zoom. Either contact myself or contact the church office during the week. But in the meantime, take care and God bless. Bye for now.